Well, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you this lovely morning? It's frosty. And I went out early to defrost the car and found out her indoors, Mrs. Angry, had not put the bins out. So I've had to do all the recycling, which is recycling at this time of the year is a big job, isn't it? That Amazon is a mighty river of cardboard. That's all I'll say. And uh, yesterday I went out to Sainsbury's, bought nine bottles of Bailey's at £15 a litre. Which makes petrol look cheap, doesn't it? If you could get a car that ran on Bailey's, you'd never drive it, would you? But uh, anyway, so and that's because today, although it's Tuesday, it's the day that the hygienist comes in, so we have like receptionist, two nurses, me and the hygienist, so we're all in at the same time. So I've bought, and also we have, because we're in a shared building, we have like two receptionists and a, and a sort of bookkeeping lady. Who's got like a really dirty sense of humour actually. She's so funny, she's so prim and proper. Butter wouldn't melt in her mouth, you know. She's like a Mrs. Bucket, a young Mrs. Bucket. And then uh, I was talking with the women on reception, and they're, you know, like one of them used to be like a holiday rep. Uh, used to, uh, her job was to try and get everybody drunk, you know, and take them around all the local bars and everything. And so she's sort of quite chatty, you know, like as in sort of you know very very quick to have a chat about absolutely anything and and she was looking a bit tired and she asked me if um, I told her I got three very good dental chairs she could have a sleep in well, it was a genuine offer because actually last week I was so tired at lunchtime because this cough keeping me up at night <coughs> quick demonstration that I actually went to sleep in the chair for half an hour at lunchtime and jolly nice it was as well to have a nap but uh, and she said, "Oh, she said, can you go to can you go to sleep in those dental chairs?" So I said, "Yeah." I said, "You can do anything in them." See, because I'm quick like that, you know. I'm like it's a bit saucy, but I thought, no, she's a bit saucy as well. But it's never going to come to anything. But she likes a saucy joke, and she went, "Oh, oh," and I thought, "Oh, okay, too far," you know. Honestly, the women's modern modern <laughs> modern approach to basic <laughs> the basic necessities of life. I'm really despair for any future generations. I think the birth rate's going to drop. They're not even allowed to touch women now, let alone discuss anything. So, you know, we've got less bawdy. We're less bawdy as a generation, I think. <clears throat> I mean, the Victorians were. Uh, the, sort of the world's worst prudes apparently but in public but I mean privately they still managed to reproduce so they must have known what was what anyway this woman who's doing the books like gave her a big snigger so she wasn't you see the thing about a good joke is that it mustn't people mustn't be expecting it it's, you're not supposed to telegraph a joke. It has to come out of the blue, you know? It has to, like, just... One minute you're standing there, next minute, the joke gives you a left hook. Your brain suddenly clicks, and you realise it's... That was actually... There's actually something funny about that. So the two on the desk, they were like... And, but the, she, she actually laughed. And I, and I thought it was worth a laugh. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, I didn't take it any further. <clears throat> if you want to take it further, then my only advice is to give the nurse the controls to the chair. That's all. I'm not saying any more. That's it. That's my final word on the subject. Anyway, we're all looking forward to Christmas. I might have a glass of Bailey's. The uh, staff meal went well. It didn't... I mean... I don't know... <coughs> Let me just turn, I'll turn a bit of the noise off here. 
can you hear like a whirring? That's not my brain, in case you're wondering. I think it's the wheel bearings on the car are going. Something's going wrong with this car. I don't know why, it's only done 81,000 miles. <clears throat> so, you know, I mean, we didn't go out for a drink afterwards, we didn't go down a club afterwards, we just all, we sat around, we had a very nice meal. Actually, it was all right, the meal. I mean, I found the best restaurant. This is the problem, you just cannot get the best of anything anymore. I found the sort of the best restaurant in the area, and <clears throat> it wasn't brilliant, you know? It just wasn't, perhaps I'm, I need to try a few other places, but, and I don't know whether the places that are really brilliant around about Christmas time, they just get commercial, or they just get rushed off their feet, or I don't know, they take on staff that aren't really trained in sort of silver service or whatever. But they did this thing with the wine where they, um, they pour the wine out and then they take it away. They don't leave it at the table. So when you want some more wine, they're supposed to notice that you want more wine and come and keep your glasses filled up. But we couldn't keep our glasses full. All our glasses were empty all the time. And I've worked out that it's because they were full. And whereas normally they would come round with the wine, they were so busy taking food out and taking plates away that the wine service just got put on the back burner, you know. So I've got seven people sitting around with empty wine glasses and every time you want a glass of wine um, you had to say like, you know, can you come fill the glasses up? And then, and you didn't know how much wine you had left because sometimes you said like, could we, can you give people some more red wine? And they'd say, well, your red wine's won out. So then you're like, okay, well, for God's sake, you know, you can just go and get us another bottle of red. And, uh, and I said to them, can you just leave the wine on the table? And they, no, oh, no, we can't do that. No, don't worry, we'll be quicker. We'll be quicker in the future. So that annoyed me. And then the other thing was that um, the food. I mean, I know the chef. He used to be a patient of mine. For, for a long, long time he was a patient, from the mid-80s through to, you know, for nearly 20 years. And I used to eat at their restaurant a lot. And he is like, a, he's quite a genuine. He's not like a Gordon Ramsay but he is some way there, you know, he's... But I don't know whether he's still in the kitchen. I think it's possibly he's got some young lad in the kitchen who's sort of got a bit more of a formulaic approach to... I mean, it was a Christmas meal, as a staff do, blah, blah, blah. I suppose you could say, well, you can't expect, you know, but you can expect, you know? I mean, I've organized some quite big meals for a uh, fusion organization in London. We've eaten uh, uh, Brian Turner's restaurant. We've eaten, you know, and even even for very large groups, you can get some very very nice food. And <clears throat> I don't know. Perhaps I just went to a good school where they had a good uh, good kitchen. But <clears throat> this sort of sliced turkey dinner that I got was just I don't know whether perhaps it's because sliced meat and gravy just reminds you of school food, you know. But I just thought they could have done something with it a bit more than what they did. It was, it was unfortunate. Uh, <coughs> I can't shake this cough. I don't know, actually it's not a cough, it's like a head cold, you know. It's a, a sinusitis that just makes me cough. As if I had a persistent cough and no sinusitis, I'd have been down the doctors. For a scan, but uh, no, it's uh, I know what's causing it anyway. We've got a busy day today, and everyone's getting a bottle of Bailey's, that's on my uh, traditional. And then <clears throat> we're sort of winding down. I've kept uh, Friday mornings free for emergencies. I'm going to send out an email to everybody today telling them when we're shut. Uh, I switched the uh, I switched the surgery phone through to my mobile over Christmas, so um, in fact I'll be on call all Christmas. My mobile will be on. Now, if I was um, an NHS practice, I wouldn't do that. And most NHS practices, um, not you know, have a break from their patients by going on a rotor where they're on call for one day or something. And, and I can understand that because the attitude 
on the National Health Service is very much the, they're all sort of entitled snowflakes and think that they they should be allowed to call you out any time of the day or night you know after they've been down the pub or uh, at five o'clock in the morning when they probably could wait until eight o'clock but they want to just ring ring you at five and um, whereas privately it's very different you know uh, privately I'd be very happy to give any one of my private patients my my mobile phone number and I quite often do write it on the back of my business card and say look if you have any problems give me like personally ring me up um, <clears throat> because I know that they're not going to abuse it unfortunately with some NHS patients you, you can't be sure that they're not going to abuse it and so really you tend to keep it quiet don't you that's why a lot of NHS dentists had uh, uh, like two phone numbers you know like a, a, a patient's phone number and then an internal phone number but uh, yeah, so my if they ring, if anyone rings the surgery over the holiday, then it will come through to my mobile. And then what I do is I can dial into the practice book, appointment book from home, and just leave that running on a computer. So that if anybody you know does you know if I do need to do anything and I've got a minute, then I can change an appointment or make an appointment. <coughs> <coughs> the um, rationale behind that is the large amount of what the, the phone calls you answer are new business you know there are people ringing up asking if you do implants or they've got toothache can they come in etc etc so and we pick up some new business like that and uh, you know you can you have to be able to say to people look I'm sorry it's five o'clock in the morning bring me back at eight and then <clears throat> but the problem is then you 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 get you annoyed you know you can't get back to sleep and so and people have rung me at four o'clock in the morning and said you know can I you know have you got an appointment at ten o'clock and I'm like well why don't you ring us when we open you know it's four o'clock in the effing morning you don't say that but the problem is you apply to them and then you know and say look I'm sorry tonight you know, I don't have access to the appointment book at the moment and then um, but then you you're so stressed you know the, the adrenaline's going and you're annoyed and that so it just ruins your sleep you know you might as well get up at four o'clock and see him at that point because you're so annoyed but that doesn't tend to happen privately so we're closed from uh, so Friday lunchtime we'll go home Friday morning I think we've got one patient booked in because um, she needs looking at and that's the only time she can come in she's having problems with this occlusal we did an occlusal filling for her so if you're doing occlusal filling for someone and obviously all our fillings are composite there's only two reasons why, possibly three reasons why they might be having trouble. One is, one is that um, you know it's not lined properly, or, and that's really not an issue with ours because we don't not line them properly. So uh, it's not really likely to be anything due to um, you know lack of lining or anything. And then another possibility is it's high on the bite, but then again we check our fillings very carefully, so they're very very rarely that they're high on the bite, and. Um, and then, uh, I mean, what else is there? I mean, there's sort of cracked tooth syndrome, uh, and there's, um, uh, you know, uh, perhaps the tooth was, was on the edge of going non-vital, and it's now non-vital. And I don't mean as a result of the filling. I mean that it was on the road anyway, and you just happened to fill it halfway down the path. You know, it's not. It's not like uh, you'd have hurried it up or anything. And we've had a couple like that, and we've had a couple that looked all right that turned out that we filled that it turned out in hindsight to be non-vital because they've come back a week later with a swelling and we've we vitality tested it and obviously the tooth is, was always dead. Um, so the vitality tester, I must say, is great. We do use it a lot. I mean, when since we got it, we've got an electronic pulp tester, and um, you can it's got a little clip that you can hook onto the patient's lip which acts as a ground plane but in fact I prefer just to hook the glove off my thumb and just put my thumb on it because it's you don't want to be fiddling around with little ground wires and things it's easier just to touch it on the patient's tooth and um, I can't say they universally love it but it's very very useful and highly useful to demonstrate to a patient that a tooth is dead as a dodo you know, because what you're doing is, I mean, you're, you're about to sell a root treatment, aren't you? You're about to sell probably one of the most complicated and expensive treatments that you do. 
and so then remember what I was saying about tangibility you know the patient needs to be convinced that they need this and so if you like electrify a few of their teeth and then and then put the old electrode on um, on the one that you think is dead and then and you can show them that it's counted up to 50 or 60 or something um, and they haven't felt anything then there's no uh, doubt and or debate at that point about whether that tooth's dead it's just then the question then becomes extraction or root treatment um, <clears throat> another tip is that if a patient comes in and there, and there are a lot of pain from a tooth um, and <clears throat> but they are like they're quite a nice reasonable patient who w might normally would have probably wanted to have saved the tooth but they're in, a, in extreme pain um, then the uh, they want the tooth out basically and but what they that's because they want to get rid of the pain and obviously taking the tooth out is uh, synonymous in their own brain with removing the pain remove the tooth remove the pain which is fair enough but that leaves you with a conundrum because I always wonder whether they would have made the same decision if they hadn't been in pain you know supposing they'd come along and you just pulp tested it told them it was dead needed root treatment or an extraction they always say root treatment but when they're in severe pain, they always say extraction. So I think they are, um, their, their decisions are modified, aren't they, by the pain they're in. And so what I tend to do is I won't take a tooth out when it's highly painful. And I don't do what a lot of dentists do, and I, I freely admit I used to do, which is just reach for the old prescription pad and give them a week's worth of Amoxil and tell them that nobody in the world could do anything until the infection settled down and antibiotics is the only thing that will do that, you know. What you're really doing is you're really just getting them out of the surgery, aren't you? Because you haven't got the time to start a root treatment. So <clears throat> what I do is I do I start the root treatment and let's face it, the you know, if they've got a swelling or something there, there's no the tooth no is non-vital anyway. So it's not like you're even really going to get them numb because uh, injecting into a, an infected area and a swollen area is not only painful and likely to spread the infection, it's also highly likely not to work. You're not going to get the anaesthesia. So um, there, this patient with a sort of painful swollen tooth is, is a problem, aren't they, for an extraction, if they're going to come in and insist on an extraction. So what I do is I just say to them, look, I'll get you out of pain which we do free of charge. I mean, and as I say, it's just a case of getting a rubber dam on the on the tooth, opening it up, and then um, and then doing what you can to de-innovate it, stick some cresophene inside on some cotton wool, bung it up with zinc oxide eugenol, and, uh, and then tell them to come back in like two or three days or a week or something, and then, and then make the decision, you know, about whether or not to have the tooth out. And they always, when they come back, they always say it's a lot better, you know, I've decided, and in the meantime, obviously, you've given them a quote for a root treatment. And they say, I'm gonna have the root treatment done. So, that's the way to handle that. But it does involve a little bit of, you know, you have to be a little bit firm because they'll be saying like, why don't you take the tooth out? And you can say, look, I'm gonna do the next best thing. I'm just gonna get rid of, I'm gonna get rid of the pain fairly quickly. And then, I'll, if you want to come back and have the tooth out, then that's fine. When the infection's gone away a bit, I'll take it out. I have no problem at all. But of course they don't. They always come back and decide to have it root treated. And they thank you because the, when they come back, you know, we always say to them, do you know what? If I had asked you this question this time, you know, last week, you, you probably would have had that tooth out, wouldn't you? And they said, oh, yeah, 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 I would have done just to get rid of the pain. So... That's the best way to handle people. And also, it doesn't really take all that long, you know, just to just to open a tooth up. And also, I would use zinc oxide eugenol. Don't use Cavit. I know there's, again, there's a temptation to get the old Cavit tube out and just squeeze a bit of Cavit in because it's dead quick, isn't it? Um, but if you can, get the nurse to, to mix up some zinc oxide eugenol to um, bung these teeth up with because, um, you never know, you know, I mean the cavity is okay for a day or two or a week or something but you can't guarantee the patient's going to come back in a week. Like now for example, um, you know, we're booking into January and so the, the patient's going to do an awful lot of chewing aren't they between now and January and you don't want them ringing you up on uh, New Year's Eve saying my temporary filling's fallen out, you know, 
So zinc oxide eugenol is, is equally easy to um, remove, but but and a bit it takes a little bit more effort to put it in, but it's far more likely to um, you know be, be fine when patient comes back. It won't have it won't have deteriorated. It'll still be there. They can chew on it, you know. All right, there we go. So Bailey's today, and uh, winding down for the rest of the week. Um, I hope your preparations are going well. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye.